Our scriptures this week comes from the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8, and from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Revelations, chapter 1, verses 48, 4 to 8, and John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Hear now the reading of God's Word. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. From the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this I was, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this week. Thanks be to God. This week, we come together among friends and families to celebrate Thanksgiving. We pause from our everyday busy lives to offer thanks and we count God's blessings upon us. However, every year I share the same sentiment that don't we all ought to celebrate Thanksgiving each day and not just one day of the year? Indeed, it is, there is a lot that we shall be thankful for from God, just as Abraham Lincoln declared in his proclamation of Thanksgiving in 1863 to declare Thanksgiving as a national holiday. Keep in mind that in the midst of our festive feasts and celebration, there are those who are thankful just to be alive. There are those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. There are those who are struggling to put food on the table in these difficult economic days. Many do have much to remember and thankful for, in spite of our many challenges that we might face in life. This all kind of put us into the season of giving thanks to God and to others into perspective. From a religious standpoint, the concept of offering thanks is nothing new. As I mentioned last week, the practice of giving thanks to God was initiated way back in the days of Genesis, when God asked the two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, to present their thanksgiving offering. 
One was taking care of the livestock and the other the farming. So they brought, they both were asked to present their love offering to God. God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected Cain's because Cain did not offer his best from his heart. Cain did not present his offering from the right with that right attitude. He only brought whatever the leftovers that he gathered from a few nuts and vegetables. When God deserves our very best. That was the very first Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving invites us to reflect upon who we are and whose we are under the sovereignty of God. For many Christians, giving thanks to God and worshiping God shall become synonymous and inseparable, inseparable as our everyday way of life. It puts, us all th puts all things into perspective in terms of our personal values and allegiance of our faith. And as our psalmist declare in Psalm 107, as we read earlier in the responsive reading, saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeem of the Lord say so, those he redeem from trouble and gather in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wander in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabitable, inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humanity, and let them offering thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his good deeds with songs of joy. Let them exalt him in the congregations of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders that those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Incidentally, this week also falls in line with the last Sunday of our liturgical season, which is also known as Christ the King or the Reign of Christ Sunday. I think it's meaningful that we celebrate Thanksgiving and declare and proclaim the reign of Christ on the same day, on the same week. We proclaim that Christ is not only the beginning, but also the end, our Alpha and our Omega, and all that in between. Christ declared that God's kingdom is beyond this world and everything that our secular world values. As Christ's followers, we often find ourselves in a conundrum or a challenge to distinguish ourselves from the rest of the world. Our values and perspectives may be different from others, but on the other hand, we are being called and sent into the world to bear witness to our faith and what we ultimately believe. We often find ourselves asking, can both worlds coexist? Why not both? Must be one over the other. Sometimes we may be asked to make these important choices or even perhaps personal sacrifices, but we must never lose sight of our role in light of God's overall mission here on this, here in this earth. 
we Christians acknowledge that everything comes from God and that we belong to God. We did not bring anything into this world, and likewise, we cannot take anything with us when God decides to call us home. God has established his covenant with humanity. We don't even need to make our request because God already knew and God has already provided. As evidence in the world that we live in these days, it is not easy to find peace in our hearts and we claim God's sovereignty in this world. We find ourselves being drawn into a whirlwind of helplessness or even apathy when we find when we may examine ourselves or even question God's allegiance and fidelity upon humanity. Some may even ask, does God even care? How can any of these be happening? Why any why another shooting? Why such devastating wildfires and series of destructive Natural disasters have left thousands homeless. Why? Where is God in the midst of these natural and human-caused tragedies? I wish I have a clear and simple answers for you, but I don't. There are many things that happen in this world that we do not have an answer to. Neither shall we be attempting to figure them out with our own human knowledge. For God is God and we are not. We take it upon our faith and our trust that God is ultimately in control and we pray that God's kingdom will be established. As Matthew 6.33 reminds us that we shall seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to us. But one thing we do know for sure is that God is not some authoritarian dictating every happenings in our lives with a remote control from a distance. God does ultimately have his sovereign purpose and timing for all that happens. God's kingdom is both present and beyond this world that we see. In the gospel lessons that we read earlier from John, we saw that Jesus was brought before the Pontius Pilate, who had both the authority to release him and or to sentence him to death. Pilate represented the worldly authority as he received direct order from the emperor. The fate and the destiny of Christ was in Pilate's hand, or was he? Pilate placed before Jesus a question concerning his allegiance and his identity. Are you the king of the Jews? That was a loaded question that in, was intended to trap Jesus with his response. Who is ultimately in control here? the emperor and Pilate, or God and Jesus. Whichever way Jesus responded, the Pharisees would, I'm sure they would be paying close attention and would almost certainly find enough arguments to accuse Jesus for blasphemy. Blasphemy against God and blasphemy against the emperor. If you notice that Jesus never really answered Pilate's question directly. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus simply responded by saying, my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus knew his overall mission was to proclaim and to establish God's greater heavenly kingdom here on earth and for the salvations of humankind. The worldly kingdom of the emperor, or all that it represents, was irrelevant and insignificant compared to the greater kingdom of God. 
The kingdom to which Jesus belongs is not a political reality, but a theological one. Jesus was focused upon the kingdom as in one's relationship with God and with one another, rather than the kingdom, which is built upon a system of hierarchy and governing power and authority. Jesus' earthly mission was to reconcile this broken relationship between God and humanity and among ourselves. As he was placed by, on trial by Pilate, not for what he did, but for who he was and what he represented. Pilate could care less about Jesus' charge of blasphemy, of claiming to be God's son. He only followed the order of the emperor. His main concern was if Jesus claimed to be the king, then the kingship and the authority of the emperor would be challenged. They might let a revolution against the people, against the emperor. That must not happen within Pilate's governing watch. Jesus' kingship is beyond what we could ultimately, what we humanly see in this world. And his subjects are far beyond just the Jews, but of all humanity, Jews and Gentiles alike. On this last Sunday of our liturgical season, Christ the King Sunday, we have been invited to take a pause to reflect upon our ultimate allegiance to our God, who reigns supreme over us or more over us in our lives. Who do we ultimately worship? God or what this world has to offer? The reality is, oftentimes we may find ourselves caught in the middle between the worldly influences of popular opinions and upholding our faith, integrity, and allegiance to our God. Some may choose the otherness of our lives to supplement or even replace our faith or allegiance to God. We may feel being held hostage by our own worldly fears and insecurities instead of being free and liberated by what Christ has assured and promised us. During this coming season of Advent, amidst the glowing and dazzling displays of distractions, headlines that may grapple our attention, various forms of temptations of earthly pleasures and material frenzies, special discounts on Black Fridays. May we make a conscious effort to reclaim and to re-examine our true allegiance, our fidelity and our belonging in Christ. The world needs to see more of God's light as radiated and shined through our lives. Let us be God's, let us be Christ's ambassadors of love during this upcoming season of hope. Let us be a warrior prayer for someone whom you may not know. Pray for them, encourage them, and support them in any way we can. As in our Presbyterian Church's faith, brief statement of faith, saying we confess that in life and in death, we belong to God. That is a profound and comforting statement to declare our ultimate allegiance and belonging is with God. As we boldly proclaim with conviction that Christ is our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. He is our Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We declare that Christ, who transcends through all times and space, will continue to reign in our lives until he, run, he comes once again. This is our greatest joy, 
and most comforting hope that deserve all of our thanksgiving and our praise. May our thanksgiving not only be a day of celebration and remembrance, but a renewal of our commitment and perspective of faith that we can live on as we reclaim God's reign in our lives every day. Thanks be to God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.